We build a software on a swamp and a sink. So we add uh, some PMI stuff, build a software, and a sink again. So we had more of the CMM, CMMI, and some ITL, and some other stuff, and a sink again, but born before that. Um, so maybe there is something we do wrong. Maybe we should move from the swamp to some other area. And you might find out after a few presentations today that it's more about Oh, thank you. Keep it here. Uh, leave it there. We will need it uh, later. So maybe you will find after uh, some of those presentations that it's not about what we build, but how we build. It's about the agile we want to get into. So now you realize that, whoops, I have a problem with my manager, with my customer, with my coworkers. And I need to have his brain a little modified so he understands the idea. So we just need to have a some small knife, uh, maybe some experts, and we'll do the brain surgery. So I will look for one. Dr. Robin, Dr. Robin. So we need to do some brain surgery, do we? You have some people you'd like to change? Hmm. Yes, we all have people we'd like to change. Don't you have someone you'd like to change in your life? Someone who's uh, annoying you or doing something that's interfering with what you're trying to accomplish. So let's, let's talk about how we might change their brain because, you know, we have brilliant brains. Our brains are perfect. Our brains are fantastic. Ah, hello, Dr. Wachowski. So, hello, shall we Robin. show them some of the examples of our great, beautiful brains? Oh, yeah, we have some of them here. All right. So, here's an example of your beautiful brain. Anybody recognize this? Do you recognize this? How about this one? You know, a lot, room full of really smart people. Really, lots of guys here. So that beautiful girl walks up to you and start, starts talking to you. And what happens? Where'd that smart guy go? So, any of these things look familiar? Yeah, maybe our brains aren't quite so perfect. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the brain, and what we thought we know about the brain. So in the past, as people did brain research, they figured that the brain was like most other organs in the body, that it just was static, didn't have uh, very much ability to change. Your, your personality was pretty much hardwired into you, and uh, it is what it is. You couldn't really change it very much. And if you had a brain injury, well, there was no hope for you because your brain was injured and it couldn't heal itself. It couldn't recover. So the other thing we believed is the absolute power of the rational brain, the rational mind to overcome everything, right? The Victorian mantra of the rational mind overcoming all emotion and all impulses. So that's what we believed. So let's talk a little bit about what we know now about the brain. Tomek? Yes, that's the brain. <laughs> I recognize it. I've seen it a few times. Yes. So anybody work on COBOL here? Anybody did any legacy computing lately? Well. Let's talk about legacy computing. Because you know what? In your head are the oldest legacy computers on the planet. Yeah, so how old are the products you're using in the meaning of the language? It's something that is, has been developed like 50 years ago, something like that. And now anyone? Okay, one person, two. 40 years ago? Okay, one more person. Maybe 30 years ago. 
More people, okay. 20? 10? Okay, less than 10. That's awesome. How about the brain we have, Rob? Well, the brain is really interesting. So the oldest structure in the brain is the amygdala. It's also called the lizard brain. So inside all of us, we have a brain that's suitable for operating a lizard. It does very simple decisions like run away from something or attack something, eat something. So all these really primitive responses. And the brain is actually, this little brain has been really successful over time. It ran animals for hundreds of millions of years. Yeah, and lizards are pretty good with them, as guys. Yeah. Dinosaur period? Well, yes. that's not a good example. I guess. That's not a good Well, yeah. you know. Lizards are way better. Lizards better, yeah. So, wrapping around the amygdala is this other really ancient computing mechanism. It's called the limbic system. So, they also call this the sort of mammalian brain. So, as, as we evolved into mammals, we had live birth and we had nurturing and caring. And so these emotional states around survival of our family and our group started developing. So we would protect uh, those around us. So those really strong states are all associated with the limbic system, the emotional drivers. Uh, so do we have anything to think with or not really? Well, that's the last little tiny bit of the brain. A small bit. So who you have in mind talking about the teeny little item? The tiny item little item tiny in little, the brain? little yeah. brain. Yeah. You have any any one particular one? Yeah. No, no. Okay, thank no, you. No, no, no. You're, you're good. Okay. You're good. Go on. So the the smallest uh, one of the smaller structures in our brain is the prefrontal cortex. It's the control and regulation mechanism. So it controls all those impulses that come from the older, more primitive parts of the brain. And it also allows us to uh, do some complex problem solving or understand what the complex problems are. So those are the sort of three main structures that we want to talk about today. All right. Uh, so let us do a few simple experiments. So, concentrate now. It's a task for you guys. How much is one plus one? You're good on that. Okay, how much is 10 plus 12? 22, oh, good on that. Okay, how much is 49 plus 177? I broke them. You did. We need to rest out that group. So the, the little exercise we did there, did anybody feel the resistance for the third calculation? It's like, yeah? It's like, dude, it's, it's quarter to six. I've been here at a conference all day and you're asking me to do math. Yeah, so what was that resistance? This is the uncomfortable silence part. Yeah, we have all these hardwired circuits for doing that simple stuff, right? We can just, no effort comes to us. But then we get this unfamiliar problem, and we have to spark up the prefrontal cortex and actually think through the calculation. So that resistance you feel is your brain saying, I don't know if I want to expend that energy. Literally, it's, it's energy conservation. So you conserve the prefrontal cortex as much as possible because it's a small part of your brain and it also uh, consumes a fair amount of energy, but it also tires out pretty quickly. So there is a huge number of items you can do automatically, basically. Adding one plus one, you know it every part of the day. 10 plus 22 is quite simple. But there are some more advanced items that your brain needs to be uh, activated and act upon, and you're not quite really sure if you want to spend time and energy on that. So your brain always think twice before deciding, yeah, I need to spend this energy on doing the advanced math. Yes. 
So why don't we do some code. advanced math and have some cookies? Oh, this is another example. So group of students uh, were asked to do some advanced math. But some of those students were given uh, to see, in fact, some cookies. So they have been next to the nice looking cookies for like 10 minutes. And you know what? They did pretty worse than the group that haven't seen the cookies. Why is that? Yeah, why is that? Why would sitting in front of a plate of cookies for 10 minutes and just not being able to eat them affect your ability to focus on a math problem? Thinking about the plate of cookies. Yeah, it's a complete distraction. Well, they actually took the plate of cookies away, and then you just got the math problem. Getting hungry, yeah. Actually, what they found is that you have to use willpower to focus on anything. And you use willpower to resist taking a cookie that you've been told you can't take. So after 10 minutes of resisting, these people were able to focus on the math problems um, 20 to 30 percent uh, of the time someone who hadn't been sitting in front of cookies was able to focus on them. And these are really nice math problems. They were unsolvable. So they were just measuring the time that the students would spend trying to solve them. And some students who hadn't had the cookies would uh, take about a minute, minute 10, and focus on it before they gave up. Other students would give up, who had seen their cookies, would give up in 30 to 40 seconds. And the last example is this uh, doctor who was doing a brain surgery because of passion having a, a epilepsy. And he noticed a few interesting things in our brain, Rob. What's that? Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a surgeon in Texas, and he... He does a lot of these operations for people who have really extreme epilepsy and the drugs won't control it. So he basically is going in to the brain to cut out that chunk of uh, circuitry that's causing the seizures. And he used to do it, just go in and do the surgery, but he found sometimes he would remove part of the speech center of the person's brain because it was in the same area of the part that's causing the problems. So he didn't want to do this, so he started using um, a little electronic electrode to map the brain around the area where he'd be doing the surgery. So he's mapped over 600 patients doing this. And he's found that most of the brains are different. And so that he actually has to do this mapping before going in to ensure he doesn't cut into the speech center. So not only do we are our brains... Um, unique in terms of how we think, but they're also unique in terms of how they are wired physically. So there was a plant of new discovery regarding our brain during the last uh, few decades. Uh, one of this is the discovery uh, by one of the doctors who was also doing the surgeries uh, and working with the patient that has a uh, disabled, let's to say, part of the brain responsible for emotions. And that's really interesting because we always would like to think that I'm making my emotion rationally, without, sorry, I'm making my decision rationally without any emotions. So I always choose the right thing because I, this is the rational decision. The thing you find out that after having uh, impaired uh, so this part of the brain that is responsible for emotion, those patients have a problem with making the decision. And it's not about the decision about the, my future wife. It's not a decision about the car I'm going to buy or where I want to go to for the vacation. But it was the decision about where do I want to go for lunch and which pair or socks I'm going to wear today. So very simple decision, still without the emotions, it's really hard to make them. Interesting. Yeah, one of the other things that we found too is the prefrontal cortex, this part of us that's responsible for rationality and the one that we attribute to all our abilities to solve complex problems. Well, it really doesn't. So when we have really hard problems to solve, what the prefrontal cortex does is it actually parses that problem out to the rest of, to other parts of the brain. So there's much larger areas of the brain called the parietal lobe 
this part of the brain is actually a really vast neural network. And so the, what the prefrontal cortex does is help us interpret and understand that problem, but then it sends it off to this area. See, have you ever had that eureka moment, maybe in the shower or on a bus or somewhere where you've been work, thinking about a hard problem at work, and you've gone away from it for a while, and all of a sudden you have that idea? Anyone experience that? Yeah, most of us have, yeah. That, is, that eureka moment is because the processing going on in the back part of your brain, the parietal lobe, has been solving the problem for you. And your ability in the prefrontal cortex is to send that out and to wait for the answer, to detect these little weak signals that come back from that part of the brain where we connect up all the, all the issues to solve the problem. So where we'd like to think that everything is sort of emotional and rational and attached to that part of the brain, there's these other mechanisms that actually really help us solve problems. Okay, I have another experiment to run on you guys. So imagine the situation, your boss comes in and says, um, I want to meet at free because I have a feedback on your project. How do you feel now? All right. So how do you feel when this happens? Ah, oh, I'd like to talk to you about your project. And he walks away. Feel great, right? You just get that burst of energy, excited, because you know he's going to give you a raise. Always. You did something about this presentation? Or is it just Windows? Uh, maybe it's Windows. Let's make life better. Okay, let me let me leave the right. laptop and we'll get back. You go, you continue. All right, I will fix it. So he's going to fix this. Um, so that part of our brain um, that triggers. What did he trigger in us? Fear. Has he said anything that we should be scared about? Yeah, it does depend on the circumstance and the context. But let's say the context is neutral. So we have a neutral context, no reason to be upset, no reason to be overjoyed. And you get that question. Still trigger fear? Anxiety? Yeah. That's the threat response. And there's a couple of overarching mechanisms that regulate the brain, or are, are actually organizing principles of the brain. And that's threat and reward. So what you felt there was your threat response. Now your prefrontal cortex knows that, well, you know, maybe he's going to talk to me about a raise, or maybe he just needs an update because he hasn't been informed, or you know, maybe he's heard some great things about me, or maybe there's some issue that I'm not aware of. So your prefrontal cortex jumps in and starts doing the regulation on those emotions. But you notice that you didn't go to the reward response. You didn't go, oh, I'm going to get a raise, right? You immediately went to the worry side. And that's true for all of us. If you, there's experiments that they've done where they looked at threat versus reward responses, and the reward responses are much shallower and, l and slower than the uh, threat responses. And the threat responses are much deeper and they last much longer for us. So this is interesting, you know, because if we notice it in ourselves um, for these, you know, neutral questions, then actually it's playing an important role through, throughout our days and throughout our responses in life. So emotional response is key. And what we'd like to know is how do we understand this and how do we modulate it over time so that we can be more effective? Especially when we need to rewire our, our, our colleagues who are having these kinds of threat responses. Like, hey, I'm a project manager in a waterfall project and we want to go agile. Hmm, I'm feeling a threat response. So maybe we can help that person understand why they're feeling a threat response and find a path to relieving that and find a path to reward. So that's what we're going to focus on today. So the brain is a deeply social, uh, the brain is deeply social. 
Uh, when we evolved, it, we evolved in families as, as mammals and then into primates. We had small groups and tribes. And uh, social, being social was a survival mechanism. There's some studies done about uh, very primitive tribal cultures and they found that uh, your chance of being killed by someone you knew was 65%. So it was probably advantageous to our survival that we really were aware of our social surroundings and what was happening. And the interesting thing about brain research lately is that, well, they've actually found that the circuits that we, through which we feel pain if we get hit or, or have a physical injury are the same circuits that are used for our emotional well-being and our social well-being. So if you're feeling emotional pain, you can take a Tylenol or a, a headache pill and uh, you'll feel some relief. All right. Okay, so David Rock comes with the nice uh, model. So he focused on several items that we find important. And those are basically the status, being certain, having autonomy, uh, feeling relativeness, and fairness. So what are those for us when we switch to Agile? Right, so let's take a look at this model and just go through it a little bit. So can we, can we go back to the model? Actually, I'd like to spend a bit of time describing it. Is anybody familiar with this model? Anybody seen it? A few people? Yeah. So. Status seems pretty straightforward. Well, it's actually status, how we view ourselves compared to our local group, the people around us. So we perceive ourselves as being, you know, being better a little bit, like winning a race or winning a game of squash. Um, that generally triggers our reward. Or if we're reduced in status, like we're embarrassed by something that happens when we're around our friends. Like not working presentation? Yeah, yeah, that would be a, that would be a decrease in status. Okay. It's a good example. So the interesting thing about status, too, is it, it's socially contextual. It's around the people we, we um, were, were associated with. So we're not comparing ourselves, for example, to the millionaire. Uh, or that guy who builds really expensive highways in Poland. What's his name? Yeah, Wojciech. So we're not, we're not comparing ourselves to him, we're comparing ourselves to our, our, our local environment. So that status. Certainty. I, I, I have an example on that. Okay. It's here. All right. I'm not certain about this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm feeling some uncertainty about this PowerPoint presentation. This PowerPoint slides. So certainty is the feeling of uh, repeatability. So this is actually tied into energy conservation in our brain. Our brains are pattern machines. So when we're dealing with uncertain environments, we have to use a lot more mental energy because we have to be really present and thinking about all the things that are happening. After we've been through something a number of times, an experience, and we have some repeatability, we start to wire up new patterns that make it makes it easier for us to think. So we feel certain when we're in a place that we understand or a city that we know, because we, we know how to get around, right? Or we feel certain when we're working in, an, in a methodology like waterfall because we have previous experience with it. Or we feel certain about agile because those patterns are ingrained now. They're easy for us to understand. We're not new to them anymore. Autonomy is pretty much autonomy. It's the ability to control our own destiny. And so it sort of ties in with the other ones. It allows us to adjust our status or allows us to adjust the amount of certainty we have. So, and it's the ability to control our, our own destiny. Relatedness is about belonging. So we are social beings, so we need to belong. So different kinds of groups, um, that we might belong to be social or at work, we relate to those groups and we relate to the people in them. And generally, we relate to them so strongly that we actually, when someone gets insulted by someone outside that group, we actually feel the pain for that person. What also happens is that people are outside our group are generally treated or thought of as 
thought differently. We actually use different circuits in our brain for people who are outside of our groups. And that we sort of default to the foe response as opposed to defaulting to the friend response. I mean, you see it on a bus. You've got a bunch of people all going to the same kind of, same neighborhood, living in the same sort of uh, housing, same sort of economic status. Probably a lot of similarities between them, but they're not talking. Right? And fairness is about, I'm feeling right about, uh, well, when I compare to other people. So when we get rice, we get the same rice, that's okay. And when uh, there is some problems, then there is a problem is shared between us. So uh, if I see that someone is getting more than I, uh, I am, and I, I think that is he's quite comparable to me, then that's something unfair for me. All right. So how does this relate to agile and to agile change? So this is really good questions, actually. If if um, if this model is true, then we can actually start applying it to ourselves and our sort of internal states as to what we're feeling and, and where we're at. So how is my status affected to Agile in my role, right? Is it going up or going down? Uh, what certainty do I have in Agile? Oh, we're not doing planning for a year? I feel pretty uncertain about this. I don't think this is necessarily a good idea. Um, so how does certainty impact, right? Or if we're doing Agile, what gives us certainty or feeling of certainty? Yeah, if I'm a project manager, do I lose autonomy when we get this Agile stuff? For example, I need to be every day on some stand-ups and talk what I did. Nobody cares today what I did, so, so I, I can feel it as, you know, attack on my autonomy. They are going to check every day, my progress. Yeah. And relatedness, right? If I associate strongly with a particular group, hey, I'm a developer and I only want to focus, be with developers, and who are these tester people anyways? You know, they're, they're the foes. They're the people downstairs who keep sending us, telling us why our, our code is so bad. Right? Do I really want those guys on my team? No. So this comes back to sort of the threat rewards, right? And looking at it through the lens of the SCARF model. So let's do that. The nice thing about change is that, well, um, well the hard thing about change is that when you're wanting to rewire people, um, you can't. But you can influence them, and you can help them see different ways of thinking. So part of, uh, part of doing this rewiring is actually sort of remote. So you need to put the tools into the hands of uh, the brain you want to rewire. So getting them aware of the model, helping them understand it, and then um, show them how they can use it as a thinking tool to evaluate their own responses and how to, how to find changes. And the nice thing about working with models is we start to see how to think about a certain set of problems that we may not have been conscious about. Because uh, these models are internal models for how we think. And a lot of our thinking is done unconsciously. So this allows us to be more conscious about that. All right, so let's talk about changing someone, shall we? So who will we start with? We'll start with Tomek. Well, actually, we're going to start with some roles, since this is more of a coaching tool to sit down with a person. So we're going to ch talk about rewiring the project manager. Oh, that's going to be awesome. Can I get my tools now? Sure. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Get your surgical element out. So what we're going to do together here today is we're going to do some rewiring. So first of all, we need to identify the SCARF model for the project manager. So if we have a project manager, and we probably have some in the room who are relatively new to Agile, think, let's think about our current state. So I'm a project manager. I'm responsible for the project. Project, if it fails, it's my responsibility, right? What else? So that would be associated with what? 
status probably. So I'm responsible. What else would fit into this model? This is where you guys contribute. Right, right. I need a plan for the project to make to give me a sense of certainty. What else? Pardon? Making decisions for the project. Yeah, I think that would fit in autonomy. I get to make the decisions. It's my role. What? Feeling of being in control. Where do you think that would fit? Right. So somewhere be between autonomy and status. I would say it's status probably, maybe a little bit more relates to that. Okay. See anything else? Pardon? Can relate to the competition? I'm not sure. Relatedness is usually associated with a group. So I guess if you're, if you're really close to your competition and they're sort of in the same business as you and you can relate to them, but I, I would say that it's probably more a faux kind of thing. Um, so you, yeah, I guess the relatedness would be sort of an anti-relatedness. How about my PMP? Oh, PMP, absolutely. The PMI. I go hang out with my project manager friends and we drink beer and complain about our projects. Management positions, status, yeah. Par pardon? A bonus when your project succeeds, yes. Another status thing. Oh, is it fairness? Yeah, it's fair, right? It's fair that I get a bonus because I was responsible for the project. Now, we're being a little stereotypical here, right? Maybe a bit of faux happening. <laughs> There's this friend, relatedness. All right. I think that's good. So this is some, a tool, right? We can sort of sit down, okay, maybe this would be a little more personal if we were doing this with a one, in a one-on-one -on -one session with helping someone understand it. Or they could just do it on their own, right? To, to fill this out and understand a little bit more about how they think. My Gantt chart, nice. <laughs> okay, so if that's the project manager, um, what would the Scrum Master look like? So what's status for a Scrum Master? An awesome team. My team is rocking. There was a servant leader which you ignored. Servant leader. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear it. Servant leader. So I feel good when I'm helping people. That gives me a, a reward. What else? Absolutely. So instead of a plan, I can look at velocity and capacity of my teams, and that gives me the certainty. I would say that's probably a lot better certainty than a plan, actually. Working software gives you certainty, yeah. How 
How about relatedness? Any suggestions? Relate to my team? Yeah, I would, I would agree. Much more to the team than to other scrum masters. And probably much more to the customer as well, right? The product owner. Sorry? Yeah. So my organization. What would autonomy look like? Any suggestions for autonomy? Let's maybe get one for autonomy and one for fairness. Pardon? Freedom to experiment. That's a great one. Yeah, every sprint we're running experiments. I get to try new things with my team, technical and from a coaching perspective. So no one's telling me what to do. In fairness, how about we all get a bonus when the project's successful? Uh, that might not be the best example, but maybe fairness comes from feeling that everyone's a little bit more equal. So you can. Th So team success versus individuals. Yeah, team success. So, so these are a little bit different, these two maps, right? So if you think about this, if you are a project manager and you know, even had a project manager said, hey, complete this, what do you think? You know, just explain the model to them and had them complete it. And then um, and you get a really sort of interesting perspective on what they think and what's important to them. Right? And then if you had a Scrum Master model, you, know, you could show that to them and scare the hell out of them. I'm joking. So, but they are different models, right? The status of a Scrum, ma the Scrum Master gets is from the effectiveness in that role of making the team successful, right? And so it's a mind shift for people who are moving from a traditional project manager role to a, an Agile or a Scrum Master role. So uh, maybe we'll have a homework for you today, which will be yeah. looking at the customer. So where it is, a customer, and now you know how to create the, this map for your customer. And then when your customer switch to the product owner, now you know how to do this as well, right? So think about the changes for the customer for, and for the product owner. Yeah, we don't really have time to do two of them today, so we'll move on to the next part. So when you're using these internal models uh, for rewiring your colleagues, um, it's personal, right? They feel it. Um, and so you have to find ways to help them do that rewiring themselves. Um, and there are, this is one technique, there are other models that you can apply as well. Um, but getting them to think about how they're going to transition their, what's important to them, is, is, a great, uh, is, is a great thing to do for them. The uh, other thing, okay. go ahead. Yeah, uh, what I was going to say that, you know guys, the experiment with Dr. Robin always taking more time than uh, expected. Uh, I learned it over the years of experimenting with this guy. Um, so we are supposed to show the David Pink, Dan Pink movie uh, about the motivation. Anyone seen this movie, Dan Pink? Yeah, like a half of you. So how about we add, we add this to the homework as well for those guys? We could. Yes. All right. So um, those of you who don't haven't seen it, Dan Pink. Uh, has a video called Drive 
on uh, YouTube. It's uh, actually one of these animated videos where they draw it out. Really great video to watch. It's about nine minutes. And uh, so I'd highly recommend you watching it because that's what we're going to talk about next. That was the video. Yeah, right. So in Drive, uh, Dan Pink presents these three core ideas, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So you see some similarities here, but Dan's focus is more on motivation and the ability to be successful. So in the video, he talks about an experiment where they run uh, on folks in, in India, rural India, where they reward people for doing activities, creative activities, problem-solving activities. And they find that the more they reward them, the worse they do. So for the economists who were running the experiment, this was quite a surprising finding. They said, okay, so we give people more money and we offered them a chance to get more money and then more money. They did three different experiments. They found that the people did worse in the control group who were, had no reward. Why would that be? Some of you have seen the video. Why is that? It changes their focus from solving the problem. It actually excites different parts of their brain, like the amygdala and the limbic system. And they found that when you excite these emotional and, and threat reward responses, that it actually limits your ability to think. It lowers your IQ. So money is important in that we, we need to have, be paid enough, right, so that we feel rewarded and compensated fairly, right, to our internal model. Um, but then we need to look at other things in terms of being successful. And that's where he comes to the conclusion that these three things are really important for people in our business. Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So let's look at these and see how these motivating factors map to our, our SCARF model. So this again sort of provides sort of the context of how our organization and how our current environment can impact our internal states. So we can use this information to help us with ensuring our environment and how we're doing the work, our organizational design, maps to these autonomy, mastery, and purpose uh, values. So when you're returning from the conference to your office, instead of trying to find out how you're going to sell other to your manager, customer, friends, think about how they're going to be impacted by it, what they will be scared of, because the moment they will find they don't like it, the moment they would like to run away from it, certainly they're not going to buy it. So think about first how to address their fears and then how they can focus on their mastery and how they can find a purpose on, on doing Agile uh, and how can they be still an, an, uh, uh, Autonomous. Autonomous. Oh, no, that. <laughs> All right. The nice thing about this is that, you know, if we look at Scrum or other Agile and Lean models, we can find a lot of good things in those models that are going to reinforce these internal, in these internal states. All right. So we talked about that model. And Drive helps us in terms of uh, and Scrum, we can look at those things as well and apply their, our Agile models and see how they reinforce these things. Okay, uh, so I have the very last experiment on you guys. I need someone who is fit and can do push-ups. Anyone? Not really? Not at this time? Right here, this guy. He's volunteered. You want to do some? Come on. Can you do Come 10 push-ups? Come on. Yes, you can. Come on. Come on. Nice. Come on. Awesome. We need, we need you here on the scene. Yes. yes. And we need 10 push-ups as well. And you count, guys. 10? 10. It's negotiating. You count. Yes. 
Okay. Uh, how does it feel now? Well, <laughs> a bit excited because uh, I started to move. Okay. Uh, I exited my static position, say. Probably the comfort zone as well, I guess. Yes, that's, uh, that's right. <laughs> okay. I exit my comfort zone. Right. Do you think you could, um, you know, outsource this fitness exercise to someone else to make you fit? Well, that's a good idea. <laughs> Actually, I just did. Didn't you? Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah, in fact. So, but, well, I think that we almost all doing that and just watching uh, sport games, not uh, doing it. Yes. And how do you get better on this case then? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't understand why. Well, yeah, we do, ex we do get ex being expert when we watch the movies, right? Uh, sorry, we watch the games, right? Especially the football. We have like 40 million uh, experts on football every time we have uh, Polish games. Okay, so um, thanks. Thanks, man. So uh, I wanted to show you one thing with that. Thanks to our stuntman. Is that there are some things you can ask other people to do, but certainly if you want to change yourself, so get a little more fit, or if you want to change your organization, then there is no chance to outsource it. So um, you need to do this yourself, right? So you need to think about your model, but you need to think about the models other people have. And help them do the change uh, themselves. There is no way to ask other people to do the change for us. <laughs>